we're going to talk for about 15 minutes before we get to our speakers today. Um, and if any of you have been to our past chapter events, I usually give um, somewhat of a kind of analytical viewpoint on um, my um, kind of outlook as an industry analyst with that kind of hat on for some of the trends and data that I'm seeing and really to kind of uh, set the stage for our speakers today from that kind of market analysis viewpoint. But before I get into that, um, I want to pass um, the stage to my colleague Emily Ullman to give you a quick update about um, the VRAR Association, San Francisco chapter, which we co-run, and also some of the updates from our members. So, Emily. Great. Hi, I'm Emily Ullman, and I'm the chapter co-president of the VRAR Association. And um, what the VRAR Association is, is a global association for professionals in virtual reality, augmented reality, um, uh, you know, any um, any of these verticals that are touching VR, AR, can be MR. Um, and we, I've, I've left a... Um, a flyer on your chairs and take a look at that, take that home. It sort of uh, goes into all of the different places that we have um, chapters associated and affiliated with um, the VRAR Association. So there are over 30 chapters worldwide. And um, our motto is growth, knowledge, and connections. And so what we have is research, um, networks, events, and all of our events are actually free to our members. Um, and so um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a quick update on our members. So we have almost 250 members, member companies worldwide. And um, this is the update since January. We've actually had 132 new members join since January. So it's um, exponential growth um, in the association. We're really excited about that. And also 17 new members in the San Francisco chapter alone. And that includes student members, um, corporate members. Um, we have um, all different levels of membership. Um, and so I just want to give a little bit of shout out and uh, welcome to some of those new members. And uh, it, is anybody here right now, right now that's a new member? That, yes. Great. Welcome. Hi, it's Emmanuel in the back. And the Destiny. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And was there, was there another hand? Um, okay. Hi. Hi. Um, so, um, yeah, absolutely. So the new members um, that have joined uh, since January include um, uh, Constructive Labs. Um, Constructive Labs believe that everyone should be empowered to create virtual reality experiences. Um, and their uh, virtual reality operating system allows rich and engaging VR spaces. Um, here, so just a second. Um, and uh, VR spaces and applications to be constructed by anyone with imagination. Uh, we also welcome Cosmic Forces, um, reimagining popular uh, media brands as mobile VR, AR games for fans worldwide, um, Portico Studios. And Portico Studios is a creative company producing serial interactive story games in virtual reality, um, powered by their proprietary tool. Um, uh, we also welcome SFSU as a, a new member, so um, really pleased to be here. Um, oops, that was that's okay. We'll back up. Um, Asa Digital, um, quality assurance and development for digital content, and that's who we have here. Um, some of our members, so please talk to them about what they do. Uh, really great stuff uh, between uh, Japan and the U.S., and so um, some really amazing things. Um, fictional force motion platform um, based on VR physics, Flective, um, led by uh, VR pioneer James Yet, um, Harriman Studios, 360 Film Studio and VR Content. Um, uh, Madeline Consulting, led by Linda Darnell, um, and then also um, individual members Rika Nakazawa, Derek Osgood, Piru Abadapur, Amy Peck, Ryan Schmaltz, Kim Pollock, and Anna Cho. And I just wanted to give um, my last two updates. Um, we've just been joined this week also by um, Visbit. Um, Visbit is a visual technology company enabling 360 degree videos to be delivered at the highest possible streaming quality to consumers across multiple VR VR platforms. And also, Yerba Buena VR, VR has an update. They um, exhibited for the first time at NAB and debuted their tech preview, um, which had positive and enthusiastic reception from broadcasters and content creators alike. So um, that's it for me. Thank you, everybody, and more good stuff to come. Thanks, Emily. And can I trade mics with you? I think this one's been clipping. Thank you. Yeah. Um,
Um, so, and while we're acknowledging people, I should also say a few more names. So Tim Aldridge, who's the guy in the back, always helps us and does such a great job running these cameras and all kinds of like utility infielder around AV stuff. Um, and speaking of AV, Aldo, who has volunteered his time with all these great cameras and our production quality is just off the charts with these great guys. And then Kevin Coons is our 360 uh, videographer. Um, he runs Coons Productions, 360 a video production house. Um, and he's our go-to guy for coming to do so at these events. So uh, we really appreciate uh, all Anthony that. Anthony Steen, do we? Yep, and Anthony, 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 our associate. Uh, raise your hand, Anthony. If you get a chance, talk to him. A uh, very ambitious young man. Um, so um, I, I want to go quickly here to kind of like lay the groundwork for our speakers and then, and then get out of the way. Um, as I said, usually at these events, I try to kind of um, tee things up with my view as an industry analyst about the biggest kind of trends I'm seeing and opportunities in VR and AR from a kind of market outlook perspective. So um, for context, a bit about me, I'm a 12-year industry analyst, former tech journalist. For the last two years or so, I've been covering VR and AR pretty heavily. These are the, some of the places I write for, and I run Artillery, which is a, an analyst firm uh, all about VR and AR. Um, so what I want to do just briefly is talk about three historical lessons that we've learned from some past tech revolutions that I think can be applied to VR and AR and the way they're starting to develop. And the first one um, is a content and hardware dilemma that prevents, presents a little bit of a challenge that anyone going into it should acknowledge. Um, and I always like to say that with VR, we're in kind of an iPhone one moment. Um, and I've, I've actually presented this before. So for anyone that's been to our events before, I apologize if this is repetitive, but this kind of builds towards a larger point of our theme today. Um, and what I mean by that is that the first iPhone in 2007, which is 10 years ago, um, we often forget it came with those like 17 apps and that's it. Before 2008, when the App Store came out, which we're all so used to, that first year, we were just stuck with those, those first you know, 17 apps. Um, and you know, it, was, it wasn't until 2008 the App Store came out. Then we saw this like blossoming of content and creativity from that third-party developer ecosystem that came around to really, you know, for the subsequent 10 years and up till today, bring us everything from you know, Uber to Pokemon Go to Waze and all of these different kind of creative use cases that built upon that initial hardware, but that we didn't really think of when that first came out. So I mentioned that for two reasons. One of which is that that's kind of where we are right now with VR, and we have a lot to look forward to in terms of that development ecosystem that's going to run with that initial hardware in all kinds of great directions. Now, the second reason I bring it up is, isn't as optimistic, and it's kind of a, a sobering reality check, that until we get to that point, we're in this kind of content-starved status at this point. Um, and, and what I mean by that is the classic chicken and egg dilemma that you see in early stages of tech marketplaces where there's not enough content and apps to drive these really large scale and meaningful consumer hardware purchases. So then likewise, there's not enough hardware out there to in turn drive um, content creators and developers to really invest heavily in that content. So it's that classic chicken and egg uh, challenge. Um, and to quantify that, the math I've done suggests that the total HMD units sold to date are about 17 million, um, and you know most of that is actually cardboard. So if we look at that kind of tier one that we're all very excited about, it's under two million units. Um, and that's not said to kind of disparage the marketplace, but to acknowledge some of these challenges, because um, if we take that and compare it to the current ubiquitous hardware in the marketplace, which is essentially the, the smartphone, there is 2.6 billion units. So we're just not there yet in terms of that like next big thing status in terms of just the sheer volume of, of penetration. Um, so the question really, again, not to disparage VR because I'm so bullish about it, we're all very excited about it, not to disparage it, but to lead into, you know, how do we break down those adoption barriers and get to those bigger numbers? And there are a number of kind of historical things there that we can look at. And the first one is content. And that goes back to the, the chicken and egg kind of construct. So uh, right now, it's, it's mostly games uh, in terms of the money being spent on VR creation. Um, this is data from Superdata saying 72% um, today is being spent on games. But where we really need this to get to become more of a kind of broadly applicable and um, adopted medium um, is when that will really start to fragment into other areas like media and entertainment and social media and communications and these things that kind of take over a broader swath of our kind of time with media. And as we do that, I believe we're gonna to start to see some more consumer adoption. Another one which is probably obvious is price, but it's kind of having these dynamics that are 
somewhat non-obvious. Uh, so among the tier one headsets, the PSVR is the biggest seller, um, and that's not surprising. It's price tag is lowest, but not just that, but it's kind of, it passes some of the compatibility hurdles in that it's compatible right out of the gate with 50 million PS4s that are already out there in the marketplace. But we're already starting to see some movement here, some positive movement. Oculus, um, you know, within the past few months has lowered its pricing. So what used to be $799 for the bundle of um, the HMD itself and the touch controllers um, is now down to $599. So that's some positive movement. Um, and we're going to continue to see this this trend because this is data from EDAR, which does a lot of consumer surveys, and it found that at the current pricing, there's only about 4% of the consumer market that's interested um, in adopting high-end VR hardware. Um, but, you know, again, we're seeing positive movement, and I think where it's going to get in the next 12 to 18 months um, is this kind of sub-$500 price point, and that's going to happen in a few different ways. One, it's just the kind of forward progression of, of Moore's Law, but also we're going to start to see the market um, populate with more hardware that's going to create competition and pricing pressure. We already see um, some hardware manufacturers like Acer and LG working with the Windows Media, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, Windows Mixed Reality Platform to um, release kind of standalone um, HMDs that are at a sub $500 price point. We're going to see that continue, and that's going to have a lot of impact on uh, getting us to that kind of more point of ubiquity. Another important point uh, when talking about um, adoption is accessibility. So I'm very bullish on VR arcades, location-based VR, places that bring uh, VR accessibility to more people without requiring that kind of initial big leap of the kind of hardware purchase. Um, and another kind of historical parallel there is that um, this is very similar to in the late 70s and 80s where, you know, before home video game console ownership, was affordable and tenable, uh, we saw the prevalence of arcades. So it's following that same historical path. Um, so for the next few years, in terms of scalability, we believe that um, VR arcades and location-based VR are going to have a big kind of market opportunity. When talking about accessibility, very important to also talk about mobile VR. Um, and I'm not just talking about cardboard, but the developing mid-tier. That's Gear VR, it's Daydream. Uh, Gear VR just recently came out with its newer version with a controller. Um, it's becoming more competitive with, oh yeah, yep. Well, uh, that's, that's the Gear 360 recording device, right? Yeah, w which is, you know, they're, they're coupled together in lots of ways. But Gear VR in terms of the consumer um, HMD um, is, is really getting better. You're starting to see competition between these two players that's driving everything forward, driving the price down. I'm very bullish on Daydream as well because Google's putting a lot of muscle behind it. Google really wants to be kind of at the front door of this next big medium, and the historical parallel there, again, that's, that's the theme here, is looking at these historical lessons, is that it did that same exact thing 10 years ago with Android in terms of putting a lot of muscle behind a platform to be at that front door. But the consumer benefit of all of that is that the bar is going to continue to be raised in quality, and this is going to cause like pricing pressure that uh, brings uh, the price down for a lot of these kind of, again, tier two um, access points. Same goes for AR. Um, it's going to be... Um, at least in the near term, um, the smartphone is going to be the venue in which we see a lot of AR development before we get to the days of smart glasses, which I believe is at least five years away. Um, so, um, you know, we've already seen that validated to some degree with things like uh, Pokemon Go and uh, Snapchat 3D stickers and selfie lenses. And, you know, even though those aren't really true AR uh, by kind of purest standards, um, it doesn't really matter. It's done the world a favor. It's done AR a favor by acclimating people to this, what I like to consider a gateway drug for AR. And one of the big kind of like milestones we saw was at F8 just two weeks ago where Mark Zuckerberg made the very bold and I think true um, uh, proclamation that the smartphone camera is going to be the next AR platform. And platform is the key word there because they are releasing developer tools for third-party developers to build cool stuff on, stuff on top of that. Uh, whereas Snapchat has kind of a closed environment and there's a handful of lenses and filters and things, but this kind of open developer platform is gonna go back to my earlier point about the iPhone one. When that opened things up, it's really gonna, developers are gonna get creative and take it in lots of different directions and not just kind of like selfie dog face, you know, lenses, but really practical stuff like leaving notes for your friends in the real world or appending physical locations with things like restaurant reviews, or there's just a lot of different ways that's going to develop. And then in closing, I'll do this third one quickly. 
um, native thinking and development. So the historical example I always like to use is that in the first days of television advertising, it was simply people standing there with a script in front of the camera. And that's simply because that's the way it was done in the previous medium, which was radio. And we seem to always see this in technological and media revolutions, this kind of habit creep from one to the next. Like in the smartphone era, you know, up till this day, but mostly in early days, people were kind of shoehorning desktop media or banner ads or things like that onto the smartphone. So I think that um, the, the most success we've seen in the smartphone era are developers and companies that develop to the extent of the platform and that moving target of feature sets. Um, in mobile, that was things like the GPS chip um, and the accelerometer and all these things. And again, the example that there are things like Uber and Pokemon Go and uh, Waze and others like that. So the translation in VR is that those that develop to the extent of the platform's abilities, which is very much gonna be a moving target with things like positional tracking and touch controls and haptics and uh, eye tracking and all these great technologies that are developing, those that uh, kind of stay on top of that as opposed to shoehorning 2D media into a um, 3D immersive environment, I think are gonna be the most successful. And that might sound like an obvious point, but it's amazing how much this principle is ignored when we have these kind of technological revolutions. Um, so I will end it there, and, and a lot of that, I should say, also involves UX design, those principles, and hopefully that uh, provides a good foundation for our speakers today and gives you a taste of some of the kind of market factors that are orbiting a lot of these discussions. Uh, so I'll actually put a period there. I'll be available for questions after. You can contact me here as well. But at this point, I will turn it back to Loretta uh, to introduce some of our speakers.